Boy, there's a big part of me that wants to just have the benediction and go home. That was the Lord, wasn't it? I appreciate his encouragement. And uh, I'm just praying that the Lord can help me to say something that will flow with it. And I believe the Lord's the only scripture that's really come to my attention in the last few days, keep coming back to it, is one that we hear a lot, but I'm not sure we can ever hear it too much. And it's the, it's the whole first section of Ephesians because it has to do with who we are and who God is and his plan and the fact that he's in charge and we fit into it. So it, it very, very much flows with, you know, Brother Steve's encouragement that we can go to him and, uh, and actually be who he wants us to be. And I went ahead and brought my NLT this morning. Uh, the NLT is more of a paraphrase that's an attempt to take the thought that people would have understood in that day and restate it in modern English, uh, where the NIV is kind of a half and half between, the, uh, between being literal and being conversational. But anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just read some of this and, and ask the Lord to help me to comment on what he wants. But what a picture this paints of who we are, because you think about, again, the situation in our country, where, where this country is at, and living through a time like this, it's awfully easy to, to feel powerless, to react to the things that are going on both out there and, and with us personally, and, and just feel like, you know, who am I, what, am I, what can I do? And, and, and again, to, like Steve said, to let it beat you down. But I believe with all my heart, God wants us to understand the big picture and how we fit in it and how he feels about us and who we are so that we can be what he wants us to be in this hour. Don't you? Yes. Praise God. So anyway, uh, I'll just go ahead and read this and, and ask the Lord to help me to comment where it, where it makes a difference. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May, now, you know, he says holy people. You've got to put that in scriptural context. He's not talking about a certain class of, you know, within the church. These are the holy ones. Every, every member of the body of Christ, everyone he calls is set apart. And we'll see exactly where that, where that fits in as he goes. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. You know, I'll call your attention to something we've used, we've noted in the past. What is the verb tense that he uses there? This is the past tense. So what God has called us to do is to step into something he has already done when Jesus was on the cross and coming to the point of death, he said it is finished. There was something that he accomplished there that God, it's like there's the full banquet table is there. It's all loaded. What he's calling us to do is to come and to partake of something that is a completed certain work. Thank God. Oh, praise God. It isn't left up to us to sort of make up the difference and somehow climb up there by our own efforts. God has done something and there is something that is unfolding in the history of the world around us and we have our particular place in it and God wants us to understand that in a greater and greater measure so that we can participate in faith and not be driven down by the things we see and experience. But he has blessed us. Now, he goes back and he says, even before he made the world, God loved us. Can you comprehend that? The fact that he even knew who you were, the fact that though you may feel like you're nobody in the, in the grand scheme of things in this world, and there's nobody here that the world would regard as important, we're just kind of common, ordinary people, you know, landscapers and, and all kinds of other things, but... Uh, God knew you and not only knew you, he loved you. Now, there's a reason God inspired Paul to write these words. God wants these words not to simply uh, enhance our theology and our, our general knowledge of God and the things of God. 
God wants us to be able to live this way. God wants us this to be our, you know, there's a word they use, the worldview, how we see the world and our place in it. God wants us to see everything about our lives in relation to him through the prism of truth. Because the devil will constantly lie to every one of us, and he does to the extent he can get away with it. But God wants us to, to have a, such a knowledge of the truth that we become strong, we realize who we really are. Because we are not nobodies in the grand scheme of things. We are God's children. He has called us and set us apart. That's what he's going to be getting into here. I'm jumping ahead. I'm going to get excited here in a minute. So even before he made the world, God loved us. And he did more than that and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Now, you know, as I was thinking about this and reading this, uh, you know, it jumped out at me that God didn't just say, all right, I choose you, and then put a period at the end of that sentence. Of course, Paul didn't know much about periods, did he? He tended to run on and on and on. But God didn't just choose us. He chose us to be something. There is an outworking. There is a goal. There is something that will happen because he chose. It's not just that, okay, you're mine, but I have chosen you to be something. Does anybody here have the power to be what he has talked about here? I don't. I'm, I'm exactly lined up with what Steve said. I have nothing in myself that I can possibly bring to the table when it comes to these things. I am dependent upon everything coming from him. But that is what salvation is about. It's never about what I am able to do with myself. It is all about his plan and his purpose. So thank God. So if you look in the mirror and you have just come through a hard time, don't lose sight of the reality of what God has chosen you ultimately to be. Do you think God is able to, to finish what he started? We say that so many times. We quote that verse. Of course, we know it's so. And that's some of what he's going to be unfolding here. So God decided in advance to adopt in advance. Again, you see this a God who's able to see everything is present to God. I, I can't wrap my brain around that, but that's the truth of the matter. God is not bound by the procession of events in time. It's not as like he's hanging on and hoping he can work it all out because it hasn't happened yet. As far as God is concerned, it has happened. Praise God. Don't you want to step into something that's certain and sure? I do. That's what, he's, that's what he wants us to get because it makes a difference on Monday morning and Friday evening and every other hour of every other day, the middle of the night when you wake up and the devil's trying to beat on you. God wants this to dominate our understanding so that it makes a practical difference in our lives. It's not just some theology that we get and we understand and we say, yeah, that's true. But is it really true in our experience? That's what, that's what God is seeking to do. And that's why I see the need to to go over this, because God wants to make this live. And if, it, if this understanding is not the dominating set of ideas, if you will, if this is not the, the worldview in which you, you and I operate practically, then we, have, we need this. We need to be going to God. We need to be saying, oh, God, help me, because I haven't got what it takes, and I want to be part of your plan. So anyway... God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family to, by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he, what he wanted to do. He didn't wait around and say, well, let me see if they really want me. He said, this is what he wanted to do. This was God's choice. You talk about choices? God made a choice before the world ever happened, and he made, a, he made choices concerning you and me. Wow. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. All right? This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Praise God. You think God's reluctant when it comes to you? He says, boy, I'm, I'll let him in, but I sure am, you know, I, I'm, sorry, I'm almost sorry I, I called him in. No, this is something that God gets great pleasure out of. 
the ability to take a broken, helpless, hopeless sinner and make them a part of his family, a family that will live with him forever, there's nothing that gives him greater joy. I don't care what your background is, what's wrong with you, there is a God who loves you, and if he has called you, don't worry. He's gonna, he has all that it takes to make you what he wants you to be for all eternity and to take care of the things that are wrong with you and the things that are wrong with me. And there's plenty. But he's a great God. All right? So, and so is a, is a word of conclusion in, in the light of what we just said. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Praise God. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Again, how does he feel about you and how does he feel about me? Are we not prone to think he must be disgusted with me? Look at how bad I am. But do we understand the heart of God? Even when we are at our worst, his heart is toward you and it's toward me to reach down in love and kindness and mercy. That is always plan A with God. Amen. Praise God. All right? He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Now here's something that jumped out at me in a way I hadn't really stopped and paid attention before. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Now think about what he's saying there. You know, we have this we have this way of looking at ourselves and we're aware of how we feel and how we think and how other people react to us and we're prone to say, they just don't get me. They don't really understand. Oh, if they only understood, it would, you know, it would be different. We're talking about somebody who has not only set out to save us completely, but who has a perfect, perfect understanding of everything that makes you tick and everything that makes me tick. If there is any need in you, he has complete understanding of it. He knows exactly what he's doing. Do you think God wants us to have a confidence toward him? I mean, think about it. God not only knows all about you and what's wrong with you and what your needs are, he knows what to do to fix it. And he knew concerning Brother Steve exactly what he needed to do on Friday and Saturday evenings to bring him to a place where he felt that need. I know, I know there's others, you know what I'm talking about, where God has allowed you to come to a place that you would never have chosen, but he is so wise and so kind and so loving that he brings you to that place of distress and need because you'll call upon him and he'll answer and you grow in grace and knowledge. God knows what it takes. He can see all the way down to the end product of what he is doing in your life and in mine. He deals with you with a perfect, perfect wisdom and understanding. You think maybe, just maybe, he wants a little more trust from us that he knows what he's doing. We are so prone to see our lives as a bunch of random, unwelcome events much of the time. We, we are so geared to our life in this world that we would like to be in control a little bit. Our happiness, unquote, quote, unquote, is so geared to wanting to feel like my life is in my control, it's predictable, nothing happens, it's outside of, you know, how I can control it. Oh, the unexpected just doesn't happen. I'm so, you know, that's how we think. But God is not going to leave you or me the way we are. He is much too loving to do that because we are more broken, more prisoners of our own old ways of thinking that we have any idea about. But God 
God's kindness, his love, his wisdom, his understanding enables him to work with you as an individual in ways that may be totally different from somebody else. Don't you look down the row and say, oh, poor me, such and such happened, and look at them, they're, going, they're doing fine. God is so understanding and wise, he knows how and when to do what with every one of us. What he seeks for us is to understand that so that we can cooperate and say, yes, Lord. I may not like what's happening in the, in the natural, but I believe in your love. I trust you with my heart and with my life. I am yours. Do it, at, do it what you want to do on your schedule. I'm yours, Lord. If we, don't you think if we really understood his love and his compassion and his power, we could do that? It's not easy, is it? That's, that's what he's dealing with. That's the, that's the hold that this world and this old nature has upon every single one of us in, in one way or another. But God knows how to deal with it. And, I'm gonna, and the more I go along, the more I want to say, God, do what you've got to do. Do what you have to do because I, I, I understand, I trust you because I know you love me. And I know how this is going to turn out. Lord, I don't, I don't know how to fix what's wrong with me, and you do. I don't like feeling weak. I don't like feeling that I can't handle stuff. I don't like seeing and being conscious of a need in my heart, but Lord, I have to so I can bring it to you and trust you. Because you said when I'm weak, I'm strong. There's a different kind of strength that I need than something that I can muster up. I just need him. But oh, how gracious and how merciful and how faithful he is to bring me through all, of the, all the things he has to do in my life to make me what he wants me to be. How wonderful it is when we, when we get to that place when he comes and we realize we, it dawns on us what he's doing and we just rest in his arms. He is worthy. All right, God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. We may, he mentioned earlier that he, God did this because it pleased him. And so God instituted a plan to carry out what, what pleased him. But we also know that he calls it a, mysteri a mystery. A, there's a mystery to it. And the mystery was until Jesus accomplished what he did on the cross, God hid it. It was hidden from the eyes of men. It's in the pages of the Old Testament but even the, the scholars of their day had no clue what it was, and Jesus had to open the eyes of his followers to understand what the Old Testament was about. He certainly did with Paul. He, he, actually, he took Paul's great knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and, and opened his eyes to see, oh my God, that's what it was talking about. Lord, you've got a plan that you're unfolding, and all of this was just a preparation for it, and now it's here, and now we can go and proclaim it to the world. Praise God. And so God has now revealed to us his mysterious plan regarding Christ, a plan to fulfill his own good pleasure. And this is the plan. Okay, so you want to know what it is? At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Praise God. There's going to come a day when you will not see what's going on in this world anymore. God's going to deal with it. Sadly, there's a world of, of men who are making choices to reject him. And there will come an end to all of that rebellion. But God is bringing us, his purpose involves us living here and making choices. Steve mentioned that. Every one of us makes choices every day. And God wants us to know and, and understand our part in this so that we can make those choices. But I'll tell you, I, he also wants us to be able to see the big picture and see his plan, enough of it to know, hey, I know how it ends. I've read the last chapter, like Brother Jimmy used to say so many times. I've, re I've read the last chapter, and, I know, and it turns out great for, for those who follow Jesus. Praise God. Are we living every day, though, with that knowledge, or do we get buried in the moment and lost in our own weakness and our need? 
God wants us to be able at every moment to lift up our heads and say, I know how this ends. Jesus Christ is on a throne. He reigns. Praise God. And, and, and it's going to be at the right time. God knows when to pull the trigger. And you know, Peter wrestled with this. I, I'm sure he did. In his letter, he talks about the fact that it looks at times as though, why isn't he coming? Why doesn't he just put an end to all of this? Do you know what his answer was? Because he's patient. In another place, Paul said he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. There's a, there's a heart that is looking until that last one says yes or says no. History will unfold. I don't, it doesn't mean it's going to be a long time now. We need to live in a, with a readiness in our hearts. But I'll tell you what, God is patient, but he knows when that time comes. He knew when it was time for Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't he? He knew when it was time to tell Noah, to get into that ark because it was time. But that same God knows exactly when to say, son, go get your bride. It's over. Bring everyone before you and let's, let's settle every issue that has ever arisen in history. Let's, let's bring it all to a perfect conclusion because you are in charge. There is a brand new creation. You're going to walk and talk with me and with all your brothers and sisters. Man, I want to be one of them, don't you? Oh, it's by His mercy and grace. Thank God. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read the, the, the version I have here. The, the edition I have here has got type that I would rather be bigger. Uh, I, I told Sue that I had just ordered, finally yesterday, I pulled the trigger and ordered a giant print NLT for, so that when I use it, I can actually read it. But anyway, praise God, we'll get through this. All right, everything in heaven and earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance. Now he's going to add something else. He chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. If you think your life is out of control and random, you better think again. Yeah, we want, it, we want to be able to manage it. But we're going to have to turn loose and say, God, I am not in control, but you are. The things that look random and out of control to me are never out of your control, not for one second. Do you stop loving me? Do you stop working on behalf of, what, of my ultimate good? Praise God. All right, he makes everything work out according to his plan. He does it. You know, you talk about Bible reading plans. I guess right now I'm in, in Daniel. Different plan, obviously. And uh, reading how God raised up supernaturally these heathen emperors and allowed them to have incredible control and then made himself known to them and then threw them to the known world. I'll tell you, we got a God who's, who's over all. You remember how he revealed himself so dramatically to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar published to his whole empire, there is a God in heaven who does what he does as he pleases. In the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can stay his hand or tell him what to do. I want everybody to recognize this God who is over all. He raises up those he, who he wants to raise up. He raises up ordinary people and he humbles who he will. He is God. Worship Him. I mean, God has a way to get His job done. He, he can raise up a heathen emperor and get His word out to the ends of the earth if He wants to. Man, He's in charge, and I'm, I'm so glad. All right, His plan. Now, here's, uh, here's a case where there's some paraphrasing going on that you won't see in the NIV and others. That God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth. Now, the Greek does not specifically mention Jews and Gentiles there, but I actually think they're interpreting this right. Because you look further into, into Ephesians, and you will see how Paul talks about the Jews and the Gentiles and how they become one, and that's, the, that's part of the mystery. 
And we know in Romans, he says, the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of, of everyone. To the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, Betty reminded us the other night about how God reached out after reaching all these Jews, saving only Jews for a long period of time, and then he reached out to a Gentile named Cornelius. And his household came into, came into the Lord, came to the Lord. I'll tell you, God has his timetable and his way. But what Paul is talking about is, yes, the plan of God was unfolding, and the first, his first order of business was to reach, reach out to those among Israel who were his true remnant. They were the only ones that God really recognized as Israel. Did you know that? And so God sent the word that was the fulfillment of their own scriptures and saved them and now said, I now want you to take it everywhere. So when he's talking about those who were the first to believe and now you, he is talking about Jews and Gentiles. I believe they're right. All right, so and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you and when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. You know, in other translations, it's like he, st he steeled you or put a mark on you. Boy, I'm so thankful that God is merciful. I didn't do a single thing for him to show any kind of mercy to me. If I had not if he had not intervened in my life, I don't care that I was born into a preacher's family and never really went out and lived wild. I'm no different than anybody else. Not here, not my nature. But God, for God to show me mercy, make himself known, open my heart to him, and then literally give me a different life, his spirit to live, not just, not just to teach me a different religion, but to come and to live and to give me a new life on the inside. Oh, that's his mark. That's, that's, that's God saying, that one's mine. Has God done that for you? Oh, if there's any doubt, you need to cry out to God and say, oh God, open my eyes to what's going on in this world. This world is coming to a conclusion. It's temporary. You either, all you came into this world with was a temporary life. And the question is, what do we do with it? Do we willingly lay it down and say, Lord, I give it up to you so that I can possess that which I cannot lose? Praise God. But what, a, what an amazing thing that God could take somebody who is a sinner and actually give them his Holy Spirit. What an amazing accomplishment that he did through Jesus Christ. You think of the picture that he painted in the Old Testament, how the temple had to be so sacred. Oh, you just couldn't have anybody go in there. And they purified it with blood sacrifices, but all kinds of things that were meant to show the difference between that which was of God and holy and that which was just common. And when they had gone through all of that and dedicated that temple to God, what happened? The glory of God came down and filled that temple. But do you know when we give ourselves to God as a response to the gospel, I mean, we really do it. It's not just some religious decision. He comes and he lives in his temple. How a holy God can live in somebody like me is just beyond my understanding. But he knows how to cleanse the vilest sinner. His blood can make the vilest sinner clean, like the song that we sometimes sing. Praise God. All right, he identified you as his own. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Praise God. Doesn't it make a difference to understand who we are? We are not just nobodies. It's not a matter of being proud and thinking we're somebody in, that, in, a, in a carnal sense, prideful sense, but to realize we are not victims. We are, we are absolutely in the hands of an eternal God who knew us from the beginning, made a plan, and he's carrying it out, and we're part of that plan. Praise God. Your, li your life and mine has meaning. It has purpose. We're here for a reason. 
And we do need to do exactly what Steve said, walk with him and talk with him and listen. So Paul's burden at this point is a scripture, these are scriptures we read many times, but that's all right. I, I think we, I, I need it. I need it fresh. Ever since I heard, first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. You know, I, I want to stop and emphasize something here because the reality is I don't care if you are the smartest person who ever lived from a standpoint of an intellectual ability. You do not have the power to understand the things of God. You cannot discover them. You cannot study and read this book as some people teach and believe, oh, God meant us to understand it. All we have to do is study it and we can figure it out. Hogwash. The only people who understand what God's purpose is and the real message of this book are those to whom God enlightens on the inside. And it's going to have to get past your intellect. You will never run out of questions that you could possibly raise. But I'll tell you, it gets past that. I think about the, a simple illustration of the difference between knowing somebody and knowing about them. Because you could know the facts about somebody and learn more and more about them. But there is a difference in knowing them and spending time with them and getting to know them as a, as a person. There's a knowledge that gets, goes past the mind. You might still not know a lot of facts. There may be more facts you, you, would, you would learn about them, but you can come to say, I know them. There's a knowledge that goes way down deep. You know, that's how when God called Paul, that was his testimony, God shined the light. Just the same God who spoke and said, let there be light, he said, let there be light in Paul. And that's what every single human being needs is for God to shine his light, to bypass your understanding, go straight to your heart and say, I am God, there's none else. I made you to know me but you're a sinner, you need a Savior. You need to go surrender your life to me and I have the power to make it new. That's, that's the message and the hope of the gospel. But folks, is there anybody here that has such a level of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you can say, okay, I got that, let's go on to something else. We need to be praying. We need to be seeing more than we see. God has more for us. There is an, there's an endless array of knowledge and wisdom and understanding that you and I have never plumbed the depths of. And even as Paul prayed for us, because this was, this was not just to the Ephesians, this was to everybody. We, we need to be praying for ourselves. We need to be praying for one another. God, deepen our understanding. The scary part sometimes is, in a way, how does he do that? Yeah, he puts us in situations where we, we're going to have to experience something rather than, this is not classroom stuff. You can't just go sit in a classroom and get all this information and then you got it. This is learned in the school of hard knocks and we're going to have to say, Lord, teach me however it, whatever it takes so that I can see the truth about myself, the truth about you, the truth of your love for me and how to live for you, all of those things. Lord, my skills are just, they need some help, they need some work. Anybody here that doesn't apply to? I didn't think I'd see any hands on that one. But oh, we've got an awesome God, don't we? So he's, he's praying, he's seeing the need of this so that they might grow in their knowledge of God. This is, again, this is experiential, personal knowledge. This is not information, mere information. I pray that your hearts may be flooded with light your hearts, not just your minds, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Okay, so, so far, we've got a God who was able to look into the future and make a plan. We've got a God who accomplished this incredible thing at the cross and has called us and shined his light in our hearts 
but can he pull it off? Does he have what it takes to follow through? And I mean, that devil's a pretty bad fella. And look at the hold he has on the world. Look at what he's been able to accomplish. Can God really pull it off? And so that's what Paul addresses next. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. Do you think there's anything the devil can do and God's, and God's just helpless to do anything about it? Poor God, he, just, he, his, he, he meant well, but it just, just doesn't have what it takes. There is a God who has all power in heaven and in earth. He's given that authority into, his, into the hands of his son to gather him a church. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. God has the power to reach into Satan's strongholds and pull people out. I don't know who may hear this, but I'll tell you, there's a God who can save the worst of the worst, if that's what you think you are. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. So where do we get a picture of this? This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly realms. At his, at, yeah, at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Didn't just get him out of the grave and say, <sighs> he put him all the way on a throne gave him the highest place in the universe under the Father, and every devil in hell knows it. They don't want you and me to know it. They will do everything in their power to lie to us and to pull on our nature and on circumstance to blind us to the simple truth that he reigns. I don't care who wins in, in one sense. I don't care who wins in the, the election. I don't care what happens in the world. He reigns. And if our eyes are on him and listening to him and seeking him, we can find our place and our purpose in such a world as we find ourselves in. Now, as a result of what God's power did, now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things. But there's no period there. Made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Folks, what God did is for your benefit and your benefit and my benefit. He reigns over everything that would come against you or come against me or hinder, hinder you or hinder me. He is on a throne and he reigns over it. He might let us go through something like Job did, but God did God have control in that situation? Yes, he did. How did Job, how did Job wind up? Sorry, Joel. How did Job wind up? Kind of, kind of came out okay, didn't he? You think he's sitting there, God, I, don't, I, I like how this came out, but I sure didn't like the process. I'm, I'm mad at you. No, we've got a God who has all the wisdom and understanding to accomplish his perfect purpose in your life and mine. Oh, I'll tell you, do we need to trust him? Is that a need in, in any of us here? Do we trust him perfectly? Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I've proved you o'er and o'er. Like the old hymn, every single one of us has lessons of trust where we need to learn. I can trust him with this issue. I can trust him with that. I can let it go and just, let my, just say, Lord, I want your will, not mine. That's what my life is all about is your plan. And I mean, isn't that what, all, what Paul is unfolding here? Is it our plans? Are we making plans how to use God for our, for our purposes? Or does God have a plan from the foundation of the world and it is unfolding and is getting closer and closer every day to being completely fulfilled? And here we are at our particular time in history experiencing that plan. 
and seeking to learn how better to understand it and to fit in with it. But he is head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Praise God. Well, I'm going to read a little bit more because, you know, this is the scripture you tend to read when you're talking about who we are and our identity. Doesn't that make a difference if you understand who you are? If we're his child, if we're blessed, I mean, how, how many times have, has God brought this front and center? But I, we need this, folks. Every day that truth is under assault. If we listen to the wrong voice and we focus on the wrong thing, if we do what Steve said and keep going to God, God can help us to understand, you're my child, I'm with you. Yes, I'm allowing you to feel your weakness because I want you to feel my strength. I don't want to leave you in, with only your resources. I want to pour in all that I have for you. Come, and, because you're my child and I love you. So where, so where were we before all of this? Lest there be any person who somehow looks at, in the mirror and says, I'm part of this because I'm better than other people. Oh, my God. I pray there's nobody here that would, ever, would, would even emotionally think that. There, may, there well may be people who listen to this who are in prison for terrible crimes. But I want you to know that, you are, that I am no better than you are in my nature. I have, if, if the right circumstances came along, there is nothing, that, no evil that wouldn't, couldn't come out of this nature because I was born with every inclination being wrong. Listen to what he says. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now Paul puts it in a different way. He says, all of us, all of us, all of us. Paul is including himself, isn't he? The self-righteous religious Pharisee among the Jews who thought he was righteous before God because he kept the law. All of us, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Folks, every single human being is in the same category of need. I don't care if you grew up in the church and you've never, like me, you've never gone out and lived it up to the flesh and done terrible things. And then you look at somebody whose life is wasted with drugs or alcohol or crime or what have you, and you look down at them and you say, I'm better than they are. You are not. Oh, God, give us an understanding heart to know the mercy and the grace of God. If God has shown you mercy, he can show them mercy. And if you're hearing this, I want you to read the rest, the next part of this. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. That includes you. Thank you Lord. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Praise God. Praise God. That's my hope. I, I can't look in the mirror and find a single reason to have hope. But I can look at Jesus. I can get to know the God who loved me that much, who saw everything that was wrong with me and all that still he's working on. But he loved me anyway. Oh, praise God. Do we have someone to worship is worship just a form we go through or is it something that we need to reach out from the heart and say, oh God, open my eyes to see so I can love you as you deserve to be loved and praised. 
He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And then as a parenthesis, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Oh, I'll tell you, salvation is not just a whole lot of individuals where he's up there and saying, come on, get with the program down here. We are connected to him. If you are in Christ, you are as much a part of him as your foot is a part of you. Do you think he's going to stop short of finishing everything and getting every bit of him on the other side, free from all of this? I'll tell you, God, I'll tell you, if God has started something with you, you're not just, okay, I'm in, I'm in the door, but I'm, I'm a mess, but maybe he'll let me in. This is somebody who sees you and has put you in a place. You remember Wednesday night I made this comment about praying and, and standing in this hour and seeking God for what he wants for us. And I made the comment, we're, we're the ones who have the high ground here. It's awfully easy to look at the world and see it out of control and who am I and what can I do about it. We're the ones that are seated with him. Amen. We're not seated there so we can go into fantasy land and start commanding nations to do stuff like some people think, but we are there so that we can do whatever he puts in our hands to do. Steve talked about the same thing this morning. Whatever he calls us to do, the power to do it comes from him. It doesn't come from us. When the, de when the disciples went out and cast out devils and healed the sick and the various things that they did that were miraculous, did that come from them? Did it come because they deserved it? No, it came because there, were power, there was power that came straight from the throne of God. And that power is in His Son. All the fullness of deity lives in Him in bodily form. And we are complete in Him. I'll tell you, the whole deal is being united with Him. It's just being, it's so letting go of our lives and putting our hope and our trust in Him that He becomes our life. I'll tell you, God is going to have a people in this hour who walk with him and will have what we need to fulfill his purpose for us in such an hour. Thank God. But oh, do you see yourself as way down there, you know, in a bad place? You know, my dad used to use a simple illustration of one person who talks to another and says, how are you doing? And the other person says, well, I'm, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. And, of course, my dad's comment was always, well, you're not supposed to be under the circumstances. God has given us a place where we can rule over things that happen to us. Yes, we experience deep and difficult things at times, but they don't have to defeat us because of what Christ has done and because he lives within us. He has given us the victory over everything, but he wants us to experience it, doesn't he? All right? So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved us by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's the gift of God. Praise God. I need to emphasize this once again. So many people have this weak, vague idea of grace, but grace is God extending his power, his help, his influence upon hum fallen human beings who are helpless and undeserving. Because if God did not shine his light in your hearts, you wouldn't know there was a problem. You'd have no idea. But God has to show us our need. He has to show us our sinfulness our helplessness, and that has to become a divinely revealed conviction. What is it that does that? It's God, by the influence of His Spirit, doing that. That's grace, showing us our need. But then it's also grace that shows us the answer and what Jesus has accomplished for us at the cross. That's supernatural. Every bit of this is supernatural. Only God can do this. 
But okay, now suppose I get it. I'm a lost sinner. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. And, and you're calling on me to repent and believe? I don't have the power to do that. No, you don't. Neither do I. But grace is what makes it possible. The same God who enlightens and convicts and calls you to come to himself is the one who gives you the power to come. That's his grace. I don't have that power. You know, you got, you got the age-old uh, debate about the will of man, the will of God. And the truth is in the middle. God's grace is the only power by which I have any ability to choose God. That's why you have to come and call upon Him when? While He is near. Because if He isn't near, you don't have the power. You wouldn't even want to come. But I'll tell you, there's a God who reaches out. He reaches the, the most hopeless people in this planet who would humble themselves and say, yes, Lord. I surrender, I put my whole, I, I transfer all of my confidence in myself, my will to live and do as I please. I, I surrender it, I put it in your hands, Lord. You have the power to save me and you alone. I'm trusting in you. That's all he's looking for. He, can, he has the power to do the rest. Praise God. That's why he says, you can't take all right, you can't take credit for any of this. We already read that. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. All right, it's not by works, is it? For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. What did he do that for? so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. Now you, now you see another dimension of the plan. Yeah, we can look in the big picture and say, yeah, before the world ever happened, God made a plan. And I know how it's going to come out. But who am I? Where do I fit into all that? God has a plan for you. I mentioned that last week. Every single person is a unique masterpiece of God. And he has a place for you in his kingdom. And w w our place is to look to him and pray and seek him and say, God, work in me. But if there's something you, I need to be doing, obviously we all need to be praying. But if there's something I need to be doing, tell me what it is. And then help me to put my foot out there, just like Steve talked about walking on the water. He never called me to do that either. But I'll tell you, whatever God has called you and me to do, we can do because it's His power doing it and not ours. I'll tell you, we've got a God who is, who is over all. But He's called you and me for a purpose in this time, in this place, and He is the one. So he, He's the one who's working out His plan. And I guarantee He's going to finish it. So there's nothing new we've really said this morning, is there? We've heard these scriptures many times, but I, I just sense in my spirit, God wants to bring us to a deeper understanding and appreciation of this so that it makes a difference on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Friday evening and every time in between. So it begins to govern our lives and we look to Him with faith and confidence, knowing that we're not just losers. We're not just poor, weak, helpless victims. We are seated with Him. We are God's children. Blessed, chosen from the foundation of the world. Seated with Him in heavenly places. We occupy a place where the devil, he is terrified that we'll discover these things. He's the one who's afraid because he knows his time is short. That's why he's doing what he's doing in the world. He gets it. He's running out of time. Oh, God. Praise God, the, the closer he gets to running out of time, then time will be no more. And all of this will be behind us. But in the meantime, we're the ones with the high ground. We don't have to listen to the devil and be intimidated. We don't have to run off half-cocked and thinking we're something. But we can look to God with a simple, humble confidence and say, God, show me my place in the kingdom and help me to fill it.
There's no telling what God might do with people right here. You would never think about God giving you supernatural abilities. Everything about the kingdom of God is supernatural. No one can get up here unless there's an element of the supernatural in it. This is not a matter of human ability in in any area of the body of Christ, but it's Christ in us. He is our hope of glory. That same Jesus who reigns, reigns over everything for the church. It's for you and it's for me and it's every single day. And we need to look to him with that understanding and confidence. And I tell you, he's going to lead and empower us to be all that we need to be. Praise God.